right? And also, you don't want to you don't want to sort of if you're not a therapist, you don't want to delve into therapy. You have to make sure at all times that you're not doing therapy if you're not a therapist, right? Okay. The third, this is another quote from uh, Creswell, six, yeah, from Creswell. Um, the third element of phenomenology, quote, the development of interpretations of the essence of things experienced, right? Um, so what we end up doing is we make interpretations of the experience, right? We recognize that there is the experience, there is the experience of Z, but that experience of Z has really infinitely many interpretations. There are, there are infinitely many interpretations of a phenomena, right? Depending on the lived experience of the individual, whatever that experience might be, and whomever the individual might be, um, is going to it's going to skew the interpretation of that experience, right? Insofar as that interpretation is skewed, I'm going to have varying degrees of interpretation, and what I end up doing is I end up creating a very a, a, a gradient of interpretations based on Z, whatever Z might be. Insofar as I'm creating this gradient, this concept we'll return to later in our discussion on grounded three theory. The grounded theorists would call this uh, dimensionalization. We're not going to get into that now, but it's sort of the spectrum in which individuals tend to uh, range with experience Z. In experience Z of a woman's shelter, and uh, let me change the example. I don't want to keep on using the same example. So imagine that you have um, experiences of people in the last two years um, having to file unemployment for the first time, right? Many, many people had to, inf uh, had to file unemployment for the first time. The thing that we're analyzing is um, first instance of filing unemployment. We're going to interview a huge, a huge segment of the population. Let's say we have an enormous N, like, like 250 or something, right? So we have like this really, really big N. We're going to interview, do phenomenological research, and get varying interpretations, varying interpretations of filing unemployment for the first time. You'll have some people on one end of the spectrum who will say, um, in filing unemployment, there was no shame. I recognized I had to do it because I had to feel my family, um, and I did it, and I did it because, you know, I'm, I'm a citizen and I'm entitled to get unemployment. So you'll have that as an, as, um, an experience. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you might have someone who is totally devastated um, by having, and demoralized by having to file the experience, uh, file, file uh, for unemployment for the first time, right? So people who were sort of... Um, uh, it, it never affected them as, as much, and people who it affected them tremendously. And that's just one aspect. There's many, many different things. What you have to recognize is that the more people that you interview with respect to um, their interpretations, their lived experience of some phenomenological, some phenomena that they experienced, you're going to have um, the greater the end, the greater the gradient, right? There's going to be more and more of that spectrum um, in your population. And that's what you're really looking for. It doesn't have to be the case that you have ends with that, you know, you don't need an end of 250. You can have an end of 40. You can have an end of 20. You can have an end of 13 or 10. Um, but in some sense, as long as you have, I'd say roughly around four or five participants, you're going to start to see some of that gradation, right? Because all individuals don't experience the same event, the same phenomena, in the same way. Um, so these are uh, the three elements of, uh, and I'll put it down here. These are three elements of phenomenology. Um, the last, as I just said, the development of interpretations, right? So interpretations is uh, key. Interpretations of what? Interpretations of the phenomena that's being studied. How many interpretations of the phenomena can there be, theoretically? Infinitely many interpretations. The more interpretations that we have of the phenomena, the greater. So as interpretations increase, it's a correlation, right? As interpretations of the phenomena increase, for your phenomenological research, the gradient of uh, experiences or exponential accounts EXP right? As your interpretations increase, the gradient of exponential accounts is going to increase, right? My experience was really, really bad. My experience was not so bad. My experience was neither bad nor good. My experience was very good. My experience was extremely good, right? You're going to have that, that, um, that gradient, and that gradient is a result, basically, of a higher end. 
Um, and it's not just that, because there's more. You can, you can have a huge N, but demographically, everybody has the same um, social demography. You're, you might not get that gradient. If all I interview are men of between 18 and 19 years old with this particular economic background, they might all say the same thing. You want that diverse mix, too. So it's not just a high end. It's also diversity and blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to get into all that right now. Okay, so those are the three elements of phenomenology. All right, um, the types of phenomenology, they're, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I guess you can sort of uh, pedagogically divide phenomenology into types, per se. Um, technically speaking, for me, phenomenology is phenomenology. It's just all one thing. Um, there are definitely more than the two types that I'll present, um, but to stay in line with sort of the reading, um, two types of phenomenology. Obviously for it, to, for it, the types, to count as phenomenology, it has to satisfy the lived experience uh, criteria. It has to satisfy the shared experience criteria, right? Um, and it also has to satisfy uh, some new criteria that I haven't disclosed yet, and I'm gonna talk about it um, in a second. So the first type, uh, I guess this would be uh, types of phenomenology. The first type is hermeneutic phenomenology. E, M, E, N, E, U. Yeah, E, U, T, I, C. Alright, so the first is hermeneutic phenomenology. The interpretation of meaning and significance of one's experience with a phenomenon. The interpretation, interpretation of meaning and significance. Okay. Anytime I think about hermeneutic, the way I think about hermeneutic is like this, right? And I think this is the way that you should think about hermeneutic, right? Hermeneutic, it's sort of like that, right? That, like, that is hermeneutic. <laughs> it's, it's, um, without getting into all the philosophy that you don't need to know, it's, it's, you know, some, someone will say, uh, they went 360, which means, oh, I made a complete 360 change. Well, if you say you made a 360 change, you really haven't changed where you started. If you want to say, I changed, oh, I made a 180 change, right? But in a sense, it's sort of this return, a hermeneutic is, in, and I don't mean like biblical, there's different forms of hermeneutics, right? It, it is, well, I mean, even, in, even in, um, in textual hermeneutics, it's a revisiting, right? It's a revisiting of a phenomenon, right? So if I'm here, visit. I go through some series of events, and I return to it, right? I analyze it, then I go meta, then I go meta, meta, and so on, right? It's, it's sort of like a perpetual um, self-reflective process, right? A hermeneutic uh, phenomenology is, is, is based on the interpretations of, as I said, meaning and the significance of the experience, not just the experience, right? It would be, it would be a waste of time um, to have somebody just recount the experience, just flat out recount the experience. Um, so I think, it, I, I forget who has the show, it's called Locked Up Abroad, it's genius, I watch it all the time. Um, so in Locked Up Abroad, it'll be like people, typically American, no, it's not all Americans, I've seen a couple of Australians, but foreigners will go to another country, they'll break the law in that country abroad, and they'll get locked up, right? I locked up abroad, and it's a, it's a genius. The show is amazing, and then um, you know, they, so they they're recounting their events. Oh, I know I shouldn't have done it, but I was, you know, I strapped myself down with heroin, and I tried to, you know, take it over there to make some quick money, and I got busted, and I ended up doing ten years in, you know, some some far away prison. Um, it's not simply the case that you just give the account of what happened, right? Um, and given the account of what ha what happened, you hear sort of the ethical terms, right? I should have. I shouldn't have. I wish I could have. I wish I would have. Right? Um, it's it's me not just giving an account of the event descriptively, as in textually, um, but me looking through my life and the events of my past and reinterpreting the events of my past in a new vein, in a new light, with new eyes. Right? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can see, and you can broach sort of psychology in the sense, and that's the next one. Um, um, but when it's done right, you, you don't have to be, it's, it doesn't have to be therapeutic at all. Um, so, for example, uh, you might have an interview with, with someone who uh, was heavy into drugs. And this is sort of obvious, but I just want to keep it up, you know, simple. It's one type of question to ask the individual, hey, tell me about, um, you know, the ages you were and the drugs that you tried. You say, oh, you know, I was, I was 10 years old, I had my first drink, I was 14 years old, I smoked my first cigarette, by 15 I was smoking marijuana, and then I can't believe I'm using this lecture to, do, to, to, to talk about marijuana as a gateway drug. I apologize, but this is cliche. And then I was smoking marijuana, and then I, and then I just went on, you know, I went on the horse, I started doing hair, whatever. Um, the, the person can give you sort of recant, uh, recount rather than not recant, they can recount the events of their life, um, but then, you know, conversely, they can sort of recant, they, they can recant, they can, they can reject what I, I can reject what it is that I was. You know, I used to be that type of person, I no longer am that person now. That's a hermeneutic, um, that's a hermeneutic, that's one form of a hermeneutic phenomenology, right? It's me revisiting uh, an event, me having lived the event, giving you a lived experience, that's one of the criteria from the phenomenological research, but me looking at that event in a new vein, with new eyes, right? Um, and usually when you do um, phenomenological research of this type, the question is, what was it in your experience that made you change how you view experience from one time to another? 